Remember my top 11 best senators list? Well, I basically decided to do some digging and was like, huh, you know, I could have easily replaced some of these people with more people or made this list longer. So I basically decided to turn it into a continuing series. We're going to be counting all the best senators until we reach 100 to make a makeshift senate where things actually work. So this is going to be a 10 part series where eight of the parts are going to be top 10s and the other two will be not top 10s. Now that we have that out of the way, join me as I count down 10 more best senators in US history. Number 10, Harris Wolford. Wolford's accomplishments as senator started literally the day he was elected. He was running in a special election in a deep red seat that he was wildly expected to lose and then managed to somehow have a 10 point upset against the Republican. Wolford's win was actually used as the thing that basically propelled James Carville into notoriety in US politics. But despite Carville's views on the Democratic Party's left wing, Wolford was basically the embodiment of all the things he hated. He was one of the loudest voices for universal healthcare during the 90s healthcare reform debates, crafting an analogy that would sort of try to help explain why we should have universal healthcare. If criminals have the right to a lawyer, I think working Americans should have the right to a doctor. Wolford became so prominent that he was actually the second choice to be Bill Clinton's running mate. And honestly, that's kind of all you need. He was one of the loudest voices for universal health care, an issue that has basically become part of the mainstream political discourse now, so he was technically a trendsetter. Though, unfortunately, the Republican Revolution made it so that he didn't stay quite that long, not even long enough to make a larger tenure, but his short term was well appreciated. Number 9, Jacob Javits. This guy is probably one of the furthest left Republicans that we've had, almost giving La Follette a run for his money. Almost. Not, not quite. Javits basically built his whole image on being the next generation of bull moose Republicans. He frequently worked with Democrats, being one of the biggest supporters of LBJ's Great Society programs. However, he did start to break from LBJ during the Vietnam War, even getting involved in a sort of statewide issue, which wasn't even in his state, when the governor of Georgia refused to seat Julian Bond for being anti-war. He did have a semi-sympathetic view to Nixon during the beginning of Watergate, you know, basically saying, hey, let's wait for evidence. But when the evidence started piling up, he was like, oh, you're sorry, bro, I can't help you here. Now, unsurprisingly, this pretty hugely left of center platform did not necessarily bode well for an increasingly conservative GOP. So as soon as the Reagan revolution happened, Javits happened to be one of the losses, but he did have a good enough tenure when he was around. Number eight, William Proxmire. Proxmire had already had a head start on being a good senator as he was the senator that succeeded Joe McCarthy. That's basically the same story as if you were the senator to succeed Strom Thurmond or Robert Byrd you really have nowhere to go but up. And he made it pretty clear that he was intending to go up, as rather than giving the typical tribute to his predecessor, he instead rightfully called McCarthy a disgrace to Wisconsin, to the Senate, and to America, and had basically intended to go back to the ideology of the two previous senators that held it before McCarthy, albeit with a D next to his name. Much like 99% of my favorite senators, he opposed the Vietnam War, and he also tried to lead on issues like labor rights and consumer protection, trying to stop insurance companies from price gouging Americans out of $2,200 million a year. Proxmire also interestingly took a weird stance on campaign finance reform, openly refusing campaign contributions from anybody and actively spent less than $200 out of his own pocket for each election cycle. Though Proxmire again also tried to pass himself off as like, oh, I'm just here to do my job. I'm not here to cause any like big major problems. As when he did a filibuster for Reagan raising the debt ceiling, he actively tried to make it so that it wouldn't deter from the actual roles of the Senate, even apologizing that he took up any time to begin with. And can kind of tell that he took the roles of the Senate very seriously, as he has the record for the most consecutive roll call votes cast, with 10,252 votes. Hmm, might as well call this guy William LaFollette. Number 7, George McGovern. Good old one state Georgie here. McGovern is most well known for his failed presidential run, but that's not exactly why he's here. 
McGovern has a bit of a notable left-wing record in Congress, most particularly in regards to foreign interventions and the U.S. military. From pointing out the U.S. was suffering due to our Castro fixation, to of course him being against the Vietnam War, he was also on the forefront of issues like UBI. Outside of the Senate, he even helped expand the U.S. primary process to be a lot more democratic, you know, because he was in a party that was called the Democratic Party, so... They should be more democratic, right? The idea that he was the ideal candidate of the new left isn't entirely wrong. However, the reason why McGovern is not regarded higher to me, at least, is that he really seemed to lack actual backbone. When asked to vote against the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, he decided to vote for it instead. When asked to run a progressive anti-war candidacy against Lyndon B. Johnson, he said, sorry guys, I can't do it. I have to run for re-election in the Senate, but then joined in the race like way too late for him to make an impact outside of basically trying to ruin the chances of the leading anti-war candidate. When asked by journalists to use his Senate immunity to read documents that would detail the truths of the Vietnam War, he chose not to do it because it would hurt his image. He didn't even support the impeachment of Richard Nixon, even though he was the person who was directly affected by Watergate, and even voted for the guy who pardoned Nixon. McGovern, he has a lot of good things about him. I do like a lot of his platform. I like a lot of the votes that he did do in the Senate. But let's be honest, maybe it was not necessarily his platform that cost him the election, but the fact that he had, like, no backbone. Although, to be fair, it was the 70s, so yeah, the platform had a part at that point in time. Number 6. Mike Gravel. The crazy old guy who made a splash in elections 12 years apart, the latter of the two basically being a kickstart career for a bunch of kids who wanted to make a YouTube channel, actually had a career prior to that. Gravel started his political career in a very weird way. You see... He actually primaried one of the two senators to vote against the Gulf of Tonkin resolution and rarely mentioned the Vietnam War at all. That way, people would assume that he was for the war. Then, when he actually got in office, he was like, Haha, JK, I'm actually going to be one of the most anti-war senators here. Not only did he vote against Nixon's safeguard program, not only did he introduce a bill to ease tensions with China, not only did he oppose atomic energy, but as we all probably know, he was the guy that read and submitted the Pentagon Papers into Congressional Record as he was not going to get tried for it because he had Senate immunity. And even after his tenure, he decided to push for something called the National Initiative for Democracy, which is basically him trying to make it so that the U.S. has a referendum ballot on basically certain policy positions in order to make the U.S. a lot more democratic. And while all that's good, all that's great, all that's awesome, and people on Twitter will go bananas over all the great things Mike Gravel has done, nobody will really talk about the not-so-good things. You're not gonna hear the fact that Gravel supported the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. You're not gonna hear the fact that Gravel basically joined up with an alliance with Klansman-turned-Senator Robert Byrd. And as part of that alliance, he voted to keep the filibuster, and he voted for a segregationist to be on the Supreme Court. You're not going to hear the fact that he's a 9-11 truther because those are not the images people have built around him. While yes, we got to accept the praise, we also got to accept the wrong things he did as well. Number five, Fred Harris. Harris was very interesting in a lot of regards. While his state was very, very conservative, he was very, very left, and yet somehow kept winning and that all comes down to Harris himself, who was able to be reasonably poignant in regards to his policy views, forging huge amounts of bipartisan agreements. One such case was when his Republican opponent supported a constitutional amendment that would force prayer in public schools. While conservative might like that idea, Harris was able to easily explain why that was a bad idea. I believe in the separation of church and state, and I believe prayer and the Bible reading should be voluntary. Harris was also a huge advocate for Native American rights, helping the Taos Pueblo people get 48,000 acres of their land back. And outside of the Senate, he was actually one of the leading voices to democratize the United States Democratic primaries. You know, much like McGovern, except Harris took a more hard-line stance, as when they tried to reintroduce something that he hated, called superdelegates, 
he was one of the lead advocates to oppose it. Harris was just overall a really good senator. <laughs> Sometimes that's all you need. Number four, Burton K. Wheeler. Wheeler was so good that after one year in the Senate, Robert La Follette was like, no, 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 shut up. You need to be my running mate. Wheeler is pretty much the ideal picture of a progressive. From the beginning of his career where he was exposing corruption regarding the Teapot Dome scandal, to him being a fierce non-interventionist, to him being a huge New Deal Democrat, and instituting a 50,000 watt cap on radio stations as a way to prevent radio monopolies, Wheeler was so good that many people tried to draft him to run a campaign to the left of Roosevelt when they thought that the New Deal wasn't exactly meeting up to their expectations. Another good thing about Wheeler was that he was actually able to change his mind when things needed to be changed. While he originally started as a huge non-interventionist, after Pearl Harbor, he simply stated, the only thing to do now is to lick the hell out of him. Basically, he always tried to take the principled stance as opposed to the stance that would get in places. When he felt that it wasn't the right for the United States to get involved in conflict, he would oppose it. But when he felt that it was necessary, he would be in favor of it. However, some of his anti-World War II stuff did start to get iffy as it just so happened that there was overlap between people who were principally against the United States entering conflicts and people who were opposed to the US entering this specific conflict because it was attacking a person that they admired. And it just so happened that Wheeler did at least unwittingly ally with these people over common ground, even getting to the point where he would sometimes echo certain sentiments against certain individuals, such as when he started a congressional committee to investigate interventionists in the motion picture industry, which many people saw as directly targeting foreign-born Jewish filmmakers who were making propaganda films to try and get the US to join in World War II, trying to paint their intentions as inherently malicious, when in fact it 100% makes sense that they would make these kinds of movies. But it does seem like it's coming off more like he was naive and didn't know any better, as a lot of people in the US didn't actually know the fullest extent of what was going on in Germany. The real question would be, if he had known, would he have changed his opinion? And it seems like he kinda did. Number three, Glenn H. Taylor. Fun fact, Glenn and Wheeler are so similar that you could technically make the case for either of the two to get the number three spot. However, Glenn gets it for me for three reasons. One, his personality. You don't get the nickname Singing Cowboy just because you're a boring cog in the machine. He definitely had a very interesting personality for a guy in the Senate. Sometimes that meant he would ride his horse on the Senate stairs, sometimes that meant he'd sing a song, and sometimes that means he'd kick your butt. Two, policies. Taylor is ranked the second furthest left senator in the history of the United States. And that is definitely a plus for me. He was the very early advocate for civil rights, even preventing a corrupt, openly segregationist senator from getting his seat. He was also a critic of the Truman foreign policy, which of course made him a target by essentially both major parties. However, being Henry Wallace's running mate was the final straw for them in that regard. And that basically proves he's legit. But you know what's not legit? That hairline. But that doesn't really detract from number three. Just look at him. This speaks for itself. Number two, Wayne Morse. Yes, a Republican is ranked this high on the list, much like how he's ranked as the furthest left senator in US history, which probably does indicate that the, we need to take a better look at how we rank the furthest left senators and not, because that means he ranks further left than two socialists. Well, actually the ranking ranks all members of Congress from 2002 to 1976 or something so that means he outranks a bunch of socialists so but that doesn't really detract from the major point either way you look at it morse makes jacob javits look like barry goldwater like seriously like as soon as he got elected he clashed with the gop that had shifted away from the la follette ideology the biggest example of that split was that he voted against Taft Harley, while a majority of Republicans voted for it. In fact, I call him a Republican, but not that long afterwards, he saw that the GOP was heading in the direction of Nixon and McCarthy, 
and decided to become an independent and then later even a Democrat. And as has become a common theme with this list, Morse was a very huge critic of the Vietnam War, but he gets credit where all the other critics don't get it. He was a critic before the war even began, being one of the two senators to vote against the Gulf of Tonkin resolution. He was also a bit ahead of his time in regards to the criticizing the US's budding relationship with Saudi Arabia. I might say with all of this, this guy sounds like he should be at number one, and he probably should have been, but number one spot I had to save for a guy that I legitimately felt got shafted from the first list. Number one, Paul Wellstone. Wellstone, I am so sorry. If I had known that you existed, you would have 100% made it in the first Senate list that I made, but better late than never to get the recognition you deserve. I mean, Paul is literally the embodiment of the grassroots progressive that we think of nowadays. Howard Dean literally stole Wellstone's slogan of representing the Democratic wing of the Democratic Party to get popular. For those who legitimately do not know who Wellstone is, to be honest, I might actually make a video of him on his own because his story is really interesting to tell. Wellstone was a school teacher who ran a grassroots progressive populist campaign to become US Senator using a decent amount of campaign ads to basically try and drum up support to a campaign that was significantly outspent and actually managed to win. In fact, he was the only person that actually flipped a seat in that cycle, which led to the media finally give him attention. This progressive model of being a nobody and then becoming somebody is a model that has since been continued to this very day. And while Stone was in that tradition of the left of center senators in Minnesota and actually had that very decent voting record in Congress, his only major fault was him voting for the Defense of Marriage Act, but as soon as people were able to explain to him the issue, he was like, oh, uh, that's a, man, I screwed up there, and worked to try and get it repealed. So he was actually able to show that he has the ability to adapt to changing situations, and it seemed like if he had the ability to, he could have actually went a lot of places using this model. However, unfortunately, that plan did not pan out. However, people have tried to continue that sort of momentum for him. And of course, there's varying degrees on how that has worked. But Wellstone might get his own video, so I'll save that for when it's time to talk about that. So yeah, those are 10 more senators that I actually think are, at the very least, pretty good. And you should check them out. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to notify enough future video mine comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website, follow me on Twitter, join my Discord, check out my articles on the Independent Political Report, or consider supporting me on Patreon.